Um, so I'm going to introduce today's speaker, um, Dr. Slavek Tulasik. He's from UCSC's Glaciology Group, and that is in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And so I got a chance to go through his CV before coming in here, and he got his PhD out of Caltech in 98, um, and then went to Santa Cruz really soon after that, 2000, which was right around the time I got here at Moss Landing, um, and has been a, is a professor there. So he's been there for quite a bit of time. He's had a ton of undergraduate, graduate students, and, and postdocs. Lots of papers, lots of presentations, not my field. So I was trying to glean through there to come up with some, I mean, it was fun looking through all the stuff he's done and, and, and a lot of stuff which we're probably not going to hear about today. Um, but I was trying to come up with two words that summarize a third party's view of your work, and I, could, I came up with ice and climate. Good enough? <laughs> right on. So, but today we're going to hear about something I think a little bit different, which is, is iron or sorry, is ancient iron-rich brine fertilizing coastal ocean in Antarctica? And so we want to welcome you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see. Yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me. I was a little bit afraid that I will be talking about, you know, a faraway place, uh, removed from probably what many of you study, which is more regional and uh, California-focused problems. But I was really encouraged by this, you know, the quilt. <laughs> that shows that Antarctica is not that far from Monterey Bay or, or Elkhorn Slough. And I'm sure that that's just to scale. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, this is a little bit of a kind of departure from what I normally do. Uh, it's uh, more closer to, you know, it's really pandering on my part. Uh, it's closer to what maybe you all are more often thinking about. It's gonna be uh, motivated at least partly by uh, uh, what's called the submarine groundwater discharge and kind of highlighting the fact that we know so very little about Antarctic groundwater systems and how they interact with the coastal ocean. Uh, uh, that our work in Antarctica, uh, which was basically a geophysical survey of groundwater systems in uh, the McMurdo Dry Va Valley region, uh, contributes a little bit to that discussion. And it's a, a a relatively large team of people. Uh, there's a student of mine who's really, uh, his recent paper uh, contributed a lot of figures to this presentation. Uh, and then uh, a group from uh, Denmark, uh, they built the sensor that we've used. The same sensor, SkyTem, is now available for commercial use and it's been flown actually in Monterey Bay area. You might have seen like a big awkward looking antenna underneath a helicopter uh, uh, pinging uh, electromagnetic waves and imaging the groundwater in the subsurface. Uh, and then a, a bunch of people, uh, mostly kind of uh, traditional Antarctic scientists who helped us uh, interpret the uh, geophysical data collected by this tool. And of course, nothing happens without uh, money and without logistical support, especially in Antarctica where it's hard to uh, do anything. So NSF funding and USAP uh, logistical support. Uh, before I move on to, oops, sorry, uh, to talk about, uh, here it is. Well, somehow I'm having problems. Uh, let me, okay, here it is. I'm supposed to, because uh, several years ago as, as UCSD started to admit more and more diverse body of students, uh, many of whom have, and, and, you know, are the first students going to uh, college and getting college degrees, they started to, uh, you know, they reached out to the faculty and asked, well, you know, is any of you first generation faculty? And it turned out that uh, I basically am the first, uh, with my brother, the first person in my family, my blue collar family, uh, that got high school diploma and then undergraduate degree and then graduate degree. And that's partly because of this little thing called World War II when my parents were young people and somehow Nazis didn't really feel like educating the, you know, untermenschen, the unworthy Polish people uh, were not offered education. So my parents who are wickedly smart, um, I would like to think that they're smarter than many of the professors that I know, uh, have never had the opportunity to uh, go through education and then worked in factories. So I grew up in this uh, little town in kind of Appalachia district in communist Poland and then as soon as communism ended and I got a passport, I made it out of there. And uh, through a sequence of different events, I made it to this little small 
private school in Southern California, uh, where I uh, got a master's degree first and, and then a PhD. Uh, and then since year 2000, as it was said, I've been at UCSC, uh, climbing gradually for the faculty, you know, hoops. Uh, and then uh, the last slide, if it ever collab cooperates with me, oh, it's be probably because of the size of the figures that I, uh, here it is. So just to build my Antarctic credentials and polar research credentials, here it is. I spent, if you uh, calculate all the time I spent in tents on or near glaciers, it's almost three years by now. So I wasted a lot of time away from my family. Uh, I've uh, participated, uh, mostly led 13 Antarctic expeditions, and then uh, three to Greenland, five to Iceland, five to Alaska, and five to Arctic Canada. As you can see, five is kind of my usual limit except for Antarctica. <laughs> if you waste a lot of time away from your family, somebody will, on a committee that uh, finds little things in Antarctica and gives them names, will uh, give a, a name to a glacier, to uh, your name to a glacier, as this glacier that sits on top of the tallest mountain in Antarctica now has my father's name. OK, um, so let's see. This seems to be, oh, yep. I skipped through one thing, which we'll go back to briefly. Here it is. So this is my outline for the presentation. We went through this. Then we're going to start talking about submarine groundwater discharge in general, and then in Antarctica specifically. Hydrogeology of Antarctica, which is a, you know, basically a very under, uh, under uh, investigated uh, topic. And then case study, it's our geophysical survey looking for groundwater in one region one part of Antarctica, then finding that groundwater, finding out that that groundwater turns out to be not freshwater, but brines, and finding out that, that those brines are connected uh, in the subsurface to the coastal ocean. So indeed, there may be SGD happening at high concentration in this region. And then I'll uh, use other data sets to tell you a little bit about the brine chemistry and why it's there, why we have a very hypersaline groundwater system rather than fresh groundwater system. And then uh, throw at you some uh, SGD nutrient flux estimates for the entire continent, and then I'll set you free after that. So now this is very uh, finicky, so I'm going to go slowly back to where we were, which is beginning of section two. OK, move on, move on. OK, I might just have better luck with. Oh hand motions. Here it is. Uh, not this way, this way, this way. No, this way. Oh, OK, here. Here it is. Beautiful picture of Antarctica. Flying towards McMurdo Station. Uh, yeah, so uh, submarine groundwater discharge. Most of you know, many of you probably know more about it than I do. Uh, but I'll just give you an introduction just to make sure that we're on the same page. So uh, submarine groundwater discharge is a huge deal globally. Yes, it's, it's the ability of uh, the groundwater to discharge directly rather than through rivers to the coastal ocean and bring nutrients into the coastal ocean. This is a picture from one of the, a publication by one of the people who are kind of bigwigs in this uh, area. And uh, then uh, a little table that compiles different estimates of how much groundwater there is coming into the coast, directly into the coastal ocean and how much they, that groundwater might, might be bringing in terms of uh, the different biologically important uh, chemicals. Uh, and this is from a, a Polish compilation, Szymczycha and Pempkowiak, and I'm one of the few people who can actually pronounce that. <laughs> Anyhow, so you can see there is huge variability in the, these estimates. And that's a reflection that even in continents that are not as far away and as weird as Antarctica is, it is very hard to quantify how much water goes directly from groundwater systems into the coastal ocean uh, and, and quantify how, much, how many nutrients, how much uh, in terms of a com chemical load is coming with that groundwater. Uh, but the estimates that do exist tell us that you know, the, these SGD nutrient fluxes may be greater than what all the rivers of the world are bringing together into the coastal ocean. And that's why the SGD you know, uh, thing has been uh, very vigorously studied over the last several decades. 
Now, moving on to Antarctica, things get even worse than they are for other continents because now you have this, you, know, you have a remote continent that's hard to access. Most of the groundwater systems are buried under a couple kilometers of, or th two, three, four kilometers of ice. So it's really hard to study that. Uh, so there's very little knowledge, very few constraints. And yet, there is importance here. Uh, there, obviously, whether or not there's a lot of stuff, a lot of nutrients coming off the continent with groundwater into the coastal zone uh, would help determine the modern productivity of that coastal zone. Uh, and then uh, there's also a long-standing uh, kind of discussion about the importance of, uh, or the importance of iron fertilization in the Southern Ocean. And that's one of the things that limits the productivity of the Southern Ocean is the uh, availability of uh, iron in ocean water. Uh, there's, there's a speculation that the reason why you have very low CO2 concentrations during glacial periods uh, when, it, when the world is cold is because somehow you fertilized uh, the Southern Ocean with uh, dust and the Southern Ocean is uh, basically producing more biologic material that biologic material rains down to the ocean floor and you're sequestering the CO2 from the atmosphere and lowering the uh, CO2 concentration in the at atmosphere, providing kind of a feedback between uh, the cooling trend of glacial periods and the lowering of the uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And there is a lot of publications on that. Uh, one of the big unknowns is, of course, uh, what are the fluxes of uh, iron, especially, into the Southern Ocean, how they vary, how they, what are they now, and how they vary through time as the climate changes. Uh, there, there are some papers, uh, this one I participated in in 2010, where we've just made just completely, you know, first guess estimates on how much water might be coming out uh, from beneath Antarctic ice sheet and uh, what's the concentration of nutrients in that water and, and so on, and came up with, you know, possibly as much as a few to several percent of uh, solute fluxes uh, from Antarctica uh, beneath ice. Uh, as, as a percent of the total, all of the known or estimated global uh, solute fluxes on the entire planet. So potentially quite a lot, especially if it's seven. But it's all just different theoretical scenarios with relatively uh, little uh, to hang our hat on in terms of constraints. And there's, you know, a paucity uh, of S SGD studies in Antarctica. There's some. And that's one of them that one of your own uh, people here, Kimberly Newell, published uh, with colleagues in 2019, uh, a study on the Antarctic Peninsula close to the Palmer Station, uh, where they uh, use radioisotopes and sampling of water, analysis of water, to actually quantify how much groundwater is coming out uh, and basically detect it uh, quite, you know, that, uh, quite a significant fraction of the total freshwater that you can uh, distinguish uh, chemically in, in the bay here is coming in the form of uh, SGD. And then RSW is uh, re recirculated seawater, which is also part of SGD. OK, so that's SGD globally and in Antarctica. And now, uh, you know, the first thing to think about is well, what is actually the groundwater system beneath the ice sheet in, on a continent that's 98% covered by ice? And here is a picture of the very few percent of the continent that is not covered by ice. So, uh, you know, in order to have a groundwater system, it has to have, and especially if that groundwater system is supposed to discharge into the coastal zone, it has to have also a recharge of some sort, something that actually pushes the water into the sediments and rocks and uh, makes it circulate towards the coast. Uh, so one potential is that we have maybe enough surface melt in Antarctica that is generated on the ice sheet, along the edges of the ice sheet, and then percolates into the subsurface uh, and <clears throat> travels through the subsurface, dissolves silicate rocks and other minerals, and then discharges nutrients into the coastal ocean. <coughs> well, that's a possibility. Um, in spite of the fact that most people, when they find out that I'm a glaciologist and I study Antarctic ice sheet, when they ask me, so is the ice sheet melting, or how fast is the ice sheet melting? I tell them, well, really, just very little of it is actually melting. Most of it just gets dumped into the ocean in the form of icebergs, and then it melts. And that's kind of a well-kept secret 
of the Antarctic ice sheet uh, that out of the about 2,000 cubic meters of new snow, that's uh, snow water equivalent new snow, that's added every year, only about 50 cubic kilometers are being discharged or melted on the surface and then discharged as liquid water into the ocean. So a relatively small fraction, 2.5% uh, of the input gets converted into liquid water. Uh, but still, along the coastal zones at low elevations and and the kind of warmer latitudes, which down there turns out to be the, the northern latitudes, uh, yes, indeed, you have some melting at rates of maybe a few to several centimeters per year. Uh, so that water could be going into the sediments and then washing uh, yummy nutrients into the ocean out of these sediments. And this is most likely what Kimberly uh, and her colleagues studied uh, when they did their research on, uh, the, uh, at the Palmer Station on Antarctic Peninsula, which is somewhere here in a relatively low uh, elevation warm place. But as you can see, there's huge parts of the continent that have zero melt. It's basically uh, no water being generated there, liquid water being generated there on the surface. So I'll, let me show you what's happening beneath the ice sheet. So uh, this is an output of a, a, a set of simulations, computer simulations, of the melting that's happening at the base of the ice sheet on a continental scale. And it's happening at uh, you know, a, a rate of millimeters per year. So it's very small rate. But you can see that model, uh, the model predicts that most of the interior of the Antarctic ice sheet is indeed melting at the base. There is actually liquid water being generated at the base. And it's a combination of uh, the geothermal flux that's coming up from the warm uh, interior of the Earth. And also the other source of heat that's causing this melting is the shear heating that accompanies any motion. So, you know, when people do this in Minnesota or Canada, yeah, they're doing shear heating. And when ice sheet moves over sediments or rocks, it's doing the same thing. It's generating heat during that uh, motion. And when you average that heat over an entire year, which is, that's how kind of the time scale, the typical time scales of, over which uh, we, we glaciologists think about processes, then you, you, know, you may have enough heat to like melt half a, a centimeter per year on average. In areas where the ice moves fast, which is typically uh, in areas close to the uh, margin of the ice sheet, uh, where a lot of ice is funneling through uh, you know, narrow valleys and so on, uh, that's when you can, can have actually melt rates that are more like decimeters per year, uh, quite significant melt rates from that shear heating. So there is melt happening all across the continent. If you think about that melt as rain, you know, equivalent of rain on other continents, uh, it rains about five millimeters per year. And it's a poten possible source of the water that's pushing the groundwater through the system uh, where that water would wanna run away uh, from beneath the weight of the ice sheet, which may be three, four kilometers here, uh, and, and has high pressure or exerts high pressure on, on the water it's being squeezed out towards the margins of the ice sheet, towards the coastal zones. Uh, then the other thing I want you to notice here on this complicated diagram are these white areas. They're, you know, the, un unfortunately the ocean is white, but also parts of the continent are white. And uh, these regions with white color are uh, areas of basal freezing, where the ice is so thin that actually the condition at the base, there's no excess heat at the base of the ice sheet to cause melting. There's a, 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 a deficit of heat at the base of the ice sheet. Uh, so the, there could be freezing happening uh, beneath these parts of the ice sheet. And that's gonna become an important part of the story when we get to the point when we need to understand why there's hypersaline brines as groundwater. Okay, so now uh, just to wrap up the kind of thinking about the hydrology and hydrogeology of the Antarctic, uh, you know, we have that very tiny amount of quote unquote rain, the basal melt, happening at uh, several millimeters per year. Uh, this is about 100 times less rain that falls on average on continental surfaces. So we're dealing with a system in which, you know, the throughputs, the amounts of water that are fluxing through the system are about 100 times uh, smaller than on other continents, normal continents, not abnormal continents like the one that's covered by the ice sheet. Uh, so uh, you will have uh, much longer uh, water residence times that 
let the water interact with rocks and, and minerals much longer, so you would expect that, uh, that there's pretty high solute concentrations in, in these uh, subsurface waters in Antarctica because they are not being flushed as fast as they would be on other uh, continents. And this is a, just a graphics that NSF put together as part of uh, you know, a sequence of discoveries of many, many subglacial lakes and kind of pathways for water drainage in Antarctica. Uh, just drawing this picture of a relatively normal drainage of water, uh, except it's happening beneath like on average two kilometers of ice uh, in Antarctica. Okay, so that's continental scale. Now let's move to something that we can study uh, within a, you know, one project rather than a lifetime. Uh, so we'll move to this region, to this part of the Antarctic called McMurdo Dry Valleys, which is close to the main uh, American research station in Antarctica, which is the McMurdo Station. And we'll use this fancy tool, the Airborne Electromagnetic Sensor, which is uh, carried by a helicopter and looks like this. Um, to look for uh, groundwater. And this is how McMurdo Dry Valleys look like uh, from a helicopter as you fly over it, over the valleys. This is uh, specifically the Taylor Valley, one of the major valleys. Uh, this, for instance, is a frozen lake. So this is a permanently frozen lake. It never, uh, never loses the ice cover. Uh, it's the Lake Bonnie here. Uh, this is a Taylor uh, Glacier, which actually connects all the way to the main body of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet that sits behind these mountains. Uh, but as you can see, you have here a lot of exposed ground. Uh, the ice cover is not as thick. Even the Taylor Glacier is not very thick. It's not you know, two miles thick as the East Antarctic Ice Sheet might be, but it's much thinner. Uh, in this area, however, for a long time, nobody was looking for groundwater because there was this uh, pervasive assumption that there's a very thick permafrost, maybe up to a kilometer thick permafrost, so any liquid water would be removed from the surface by like uh, uh, a kilometer. And hence, not even these lakes are interacting with any groundwater. They're just kind of bubbles uh, of liquid water on the surface, isolated from any other liquid, liquid water. Uh, and the same, that's why people didn't think about SGD in this area, because they assumed that the, ground, that the permafrost is so, so thick. Uh, just uh, you know, another picture uh, showing pretty much all of the uh, McMurdo Dry Valleys. The McMurdo Station is off to the side somewhere here. Uh, it's the largest ice-free area in Antarctica. Uh, it has a coastal zone. It's hard to tell here, but you know, in Antarctica, all the liquid water tends to be frozen on the surface. So this is actually part uh, of the Ross Sea called McMurdo Sound uh, right there, all of this kind of smooth white area. So this is all coastal zone. Uh, and the proximity to the McMurdo Station may, made it easy for us because they have a bunch of helicopters there to uh, perform our uh, geophysical survey. Okay. Let me uh, see if I can flip it manually. Here. Uh, so a little bit about the tool, uh, how we do it. Um, you know, there's a physical explanation, but I like to think about it as the sensor tickling the ground with, uh, with uh, electromagnetic waves. And if there is liquid water in the subsurface, the ground giggles back <laughs> with the electromagnetic waves. Uh, it's a uh, you know, much more uh, much different way of thinking about it. It involves Maxwell's equations and such, but it's more boring. Um, so here is a, a helicopter. Then you have you know, a generator basically sitting right there and uh, a bunch of electronics. And then uh, uh, an antenna frame, which is built out of everything that's not metal. So wood, plastic, there, can be a, there cannot be any, other, uh, any metal parts because, other than the antenna itself because you would have uh, noise in the system. Uh, and the frame exists to carry basically a cable. So there's uh, aluminum electrical cable uh, about four strands of the cable uh, sitting on this transmitter coil right there. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, measurements that you need to have to later interpret your data. So GPS for position, inclinometer for to know exactly what's the angle of the antenna with respect to the surface of the ground, laser altimeters to know exactly how far from the ground you are, 
Uh, and that's also important for navigation because this, in, in order for this antenna to penetrate uh, into the subsurface, it has to fly about 30 meters above the ground. It cannot be carried very high above the ground. So that requires somebody skilled in a helicopter, a pilot who knows how to fly this very awkward structure uh, above terrain at very low elevation. And then there is a receiver that sits here in the back of uh, the antenna. Uh, this is how it looks like when our uh, tool flies above the landscape of the dry valleys. Uh, we flew it in 2011 as a uh, NSF gave us some money to kind of do a proof of concept study. Uh, and then in 2018, we came back with uh, the kind of full on uh, survey and we flew 5,000 line kilometers of data, which is quite a lot uh, of data. And I'll show you some part of it. Basically, uh, what the antenna does is it in induces an electrical current in the antenna and that current uh, induces a, a magnetic field that's perpendicular to the antenna and that magnetic field penetrates into the subsurface, up to hundreds of meters into the subsurface. I think our penetration limit is up to six, 700 meters with this tool. So pretty impressive how deep it goes. Uh, and then the, the, this, this uh, primary magnetic current induces electromagnetic currents in conductive materials in the subsurface. And those are then recorded by the receiver at the tail of the antenna. So that's the part of tickling and giggling. Uh, and uh, this is just uh, to show you kind of the extent of our survey. The, the cyan uh, lines are the 2011 uh, lines that we collected uh, on the Ross Island. Uh, this is McMurdo Station and in some of the valleys. And then uh, we did uh, some ground-based uh, surveys as well uh, uh, in 2017 and then came back with a helicopter-based sensor and just flew it uh, in as many places as we, as we could think of uh, to collect uh, data. And the data looks like this. This is kind of the raw data that each time a helicopter pings the ground with the electromagnetic waves, uh, the return is this kind of a curve. It actually has two parts. One is the so-called low moment to interrogate the near surface, and the other one is the high moment to interrogate the deep surface, a deep, deep subsurface. Uh, and then uh, this decay of the strength of the magne secondary magnetic field can be converted into uh, basically a profile of uh, uh, subsurface conductivity or resistivity as a function of time, where time is a proxy for depth. Uh, and, uh, and you get from a mathematical inversion of this raw data, you get a profile like this, where you have, you know, in this case, you have very high resistivities near the surface, which correspond to uh, some kind of a permafrost layer. And then you go into very low resistivities uh, uh, that correspond to uh, uh, liquid uh, saturation of uh, sediments in the subsurface. And then you collect these kinds of lines every 30 meters or so, and then you can uh, build profiles. Just a kind of a reminder what electrical resistivity of the subsurface depends on. It mostly depends on the liquid water content, so how much liquid water there is in the, in the pore spaces and then also on uh, what is the conductivity, conductivity or resistivity of that water. Uh, and then convol convolution of the two things gives you this bulk resistivity, as we call it. It's a function of basically how much liquid water there is and what's the conductivity of that liquid water. And this is published in uh, Neil Foley's uh, 2015 kind of methods paper that we have. Okay, uh, so that was about methods and now results. Uh, just a nice picture of hiking in uh, Taylor Valley. Uh, so what are, what are the results? First, I will ask you to look at this profile. This profile runs along the axis of the uh, Taylor Valley from Taylor Glacier up here uh, through a bunch of permafrost and uh, another glacier that skirts another glacier here. Uh, and then goes down towards the coast. And we lost some data here, so we have a data gap that we fil uh, filled in uh, in 2018. But that's basically flying over seawater, sea ice and seawater. Uh, so there's a hint of uh, connectivity between low resistivity materials in the subsurface and the coastal zone. Uh, there's a lake here sitting, hiding under the, these lines, and there's another lake hiding under these lines here. Uh, and this is just for your uh, reference. 
uh, kind of translating the values, the colors into uh, actual things that are there. So if you have purples, that means very high resistivity. That's either ice or bedrock. Uh, so glacier ice, for instance, has no liquid water, very little, very little liquid water, so it has extremely high resistivity. And same with uh, low, uh, per, uh, low porosity bedrock. Uh, and then another, another thing that has high resistivity, but not as high as pure ice, would be permafrost, because there's usually some water left over, liquid water left over in permafrost. So you tend to get, like this, for instance, is a permafrost ridge close to the mouth of Taylor Valley and, and has kind of 1,000 ohm meters uh, types of uh, uh, values. And then the freshwater saturated sediments will be more like around 100 ohm meters. Then once you get to uh, brine or you know, very saline uh, liquids in sediments, you will be talking about 10 or less. Uh, seawater, for reference, is, for instance, 0.3 ohm meter. Um, and brine can be 0.1 ohm meter, uh, so even lower than this value. But this gives you, it's actually an impressive uh, image in that you can see at least, at least four orders of magnitude of variability of electrical resistivity. And it turns out that this tool is actually perfect for, for surveying polar regions, because in polar regions, everything but, uh, but liquid water tends to be high resistivity. Rock is high resistivity. Anything that's frozen is high resistivity. So it's a great detector of liquid water in polar regions because everything else is high resistivity. And if you see low resistivity, say like these you know, tens or uh, ones, uh, you know, that means that you have something not just liquid, but also most, most likely very salty. We have, you know, we have had a, a inkling that there is a salty uh, water in the subsurface, partly because, uh, you know, also if I go back to that image, uh, you remember that uh, you know, the previous predictions were uh, that permafrost here is like a kilometer thick, whereas we detect permafrost that is maybe two, 300 meters or 100 meters thick, so much thinner, and that can exist in situations where you have uh, where the liquid beneath the permafrost is not fresh water, but uh, salty water. So that was a hint, the first hint that, uh, that what's beneath permafrost, what the groundwater is very salty. Uh, the other uh, piece of evidence that we uh, were able to find is in the uh, 1970s, uh, when you know, basically there were no environmental reg regulations about landscape. And it was 1970s, nobody really cared about environmental. Now it's all protected, uh, and it would be really hard to get a permit to redo geological drilling to hundreds of meters, uh, but we can still benefit from these old data sets. For instance, this one shows temperature increasing gradually here in the borehole. Uh, this temperature scale is there, and also salinity, salinity measurements uh, in uh, the borehole material that was recovered, pretty high salinities. Uh, and then, uh, and then there, the diamonds are our, our own measurements of resistivity from the helicopter sensor. Uh, so we, uh, from the helicopter sensor, we would predict that the bottom of the permafrost is somewhere here, because this is where you go from uh, relatively high resistivity, as shown here, to low resistivity, and that's what you expect at the bottom of the permafrost. Uh, this corresponds well to the change in salinity from relatively low salinities to ver uh, uh, very high res uh, salinities. Uh, and that transition, the bottom of permafrost, happens at about minus 6 degrees Celsius. As you can imagine, fresh water doesn't stay liquid at minus 6 degrees Celsius. Celsius. In order to keep it that liquid, you basically have to uh, make it have a salinity concentration that is about three times greater than seawater. So this is hypersaline brine that sits beneath permafrost. So our tool is, imagine, uh, is finding groundwater, but that groundwater is not what we are used to thinking in, in our landscapes. Okay, uh, so we found groundwater. That's great. Now the next question, is it connected to uh, the coastal zone? And we can use lines that basically cross from the land onto uh, uh, the seawater. This is seawater covered by sea ice uh, right there. Uh, so we have lines like that. And this one, for instance, shows us relatively low resistivities uh, of maybe tens of ohm meters uh, pretty much all the way to the, uh, to the coastal zone. So the groundwater system is physically at least connected, connected to the coastal zone. Another example, uh, you know, in other places you might have a glacier that kind of obscur obscures the transition from the land to, to, the, to the ocean. Again, this is uh, sea ice sitting on top of seawater. 
This is our glacier draining the East Antarctic ice sheet through a major valley. It's called the Ferrar Glacier. Uh, somewhere here, the glacier goes afloat and has a, a floating tongue uh, right there. So that transition is here obscured by the glacier. But with the tool, we can see that there's a, a continuous, relatively low resistivity zone, uh, so wet zone beneath this glacier that connects to the, uh, to the ocean. And uh, last example comes from a, a small coastal valley, Mears Valley, where again, well, we have a problem with a data loss somewhere here, but we flew the helicopter with the sensor from the high elevation mountain glaciers over a little lake and then uh, down towards the coast and, and close to the coast. Again, we can see the situation where we have relatively low resistivity, so something wet connecting to, to the coast. So our geophysical tool allows us to, to say two things. Uh, there is groundwater system. It's br well, three things. It, there is a groundwater system, it's briny, and it's connected to the ocean. Of course, this doesn't prove or quantify what the SGD uh, is and what it brings to the ocean, but at least we, uh, we constrained some things that were unknown before. So this is kind of a summary of what we found, hypersaline uh, groundwater, uh, hydrologic conductiv connectivity is possible between groundwater and the coast. But, you know, beyond knowing that this material, the, the water there is hypersaline, more saline than seawater, several times more saline than, sea than seawater, it's hard to comment anything about the chemistry, you know, say iron content of this water. But we are lucky in that in one of the valleys that we flew over, there's this feature at the mouth of the glacier called Taylor Glacier, there's this feature called Blood Falls. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's been studied by geochemists and microbiologists for a while. So we can use data from here to kind of glimpse, take, uh, have a glimpse into the chemistry of, of the subsurface fluids. And uh, this is our transition, brine chemistry and origin. And, uh, you know, if you're holding your breath, we're getting close to the end. This is a picture from a helicopter of Taylor Glacier, so we're flying kind of on, to, on top of the terminus of T Taylor Glacier, and there's this very unsightly, unsli unsightly uh, red feature here. And that's the blood falls. You can see a crack. Uh, that's the crack, the crevasse from which the water, water that's feeding blood falls, which is a natural hypersaline spring, uh, comes out uh, episodically pretty much every winter. There's a uh, water gushing out of this crack uh, in large amounts. It's maybe 1,000 cubic meters, 2,000 cubic meters, quite a lot. It's not just a trickle. And then that water comes out, uh, spreads uh, around here. In winter, it's minus 40 degrees C, so it freezes very quickly, forms all kinds of strange minerals on the surface, most of them brown or red. Another view at Blood Falls, Taylor Glacier, before we took a picture from up above, where the helicopter was hovering somewhere here as I took that picture. Uh, and this is from kind of the front of the glacier, which ends in this uh, ice-covered lake, uh, Lake Bonnie. Uh, and then here is that you know, red area of uh, Blood Falls. And uh, a zoom in shows you Blood Falls shortly after uh, water has been, or brine has been flowing out of the glacier, spitting out of the glacier and freezing. Uh, the very fact that you have kind of reddish color is a good clue that uh, what the chemistry of it is in, with respect to iron. Okay, let's go to the next one where I actually, yeah, so here, for those of you who love chemistry, uh, these are numbers taken out of, uh, Jill McCookie uh, has been studying microbiology and geochemistry of blood falls for a few decades already. Uh, so these are uh, some numbers. So salinity is 95 parts per thousand, roughly three times more than seawater. Uh, uh, DIC, uh, DOC, these numbers mean more to you than to me. I really can detect as a geophysicist only this. Uh, this is your nitrogen. And, you know, the kind of important part is the iron. Because this fluid, as it comes out, has no detectable oxygen, uh, it's basically anoxic. Uh, uh, the iron uh, can stay dissolved in that fluid. And then as soon as it com comes out from the crack, from the anoxic environment beneath the glacier, and it comes in, in contact with the oxygenated atmosphere, you start having uh, processes that, uh, uh, of oxidation that develop minerals that are reddish or yellow or brown based on oxidizing the uh, reduced iron. 
And the temperature, oh, it should be a minus negative six degrees C here, which is pretty much what we predicted for the temperature of the brine at the bottom of permafrost from that borehole data that I showed you. Another important clue uh, comes from this, that if you do look at the ion ratios, they are mostly close to uh, seawater ratios, except for some enrichment for, for these ions that are uh, easily removed by chemical weathering of silicate. Uh, so uh, there is mostly the background fluid, the fluid started at seawater, and then there was some prolonged period of residence uh, in silicate rocks that enriched uh, some minerals, uh, so some elements, including iron. Yeah, iron is highly enriched uh, in this fluid. Blood falls, we are lucky because blood falls is the only place that we know of in Antarctica where deep groundwater actually comes to you to the surface. Anywhere else, if you want to have a sample of liquid water from beneath the ice sheet, you have to spend dozens of millions of dollars drilling to the bed of the ice and getting a sample. And I know because I've done it. It's very hard. Here it just comes for free and uh, <laughs> begs to be studied. Okay. Up, up. So uh, now we know a few additional things. We know that there's lots of brine in the subsurface. Now we suspect, based on Blood Falls, that that brine started as seawater and now is hyper-concentrated. Yeah, it's more saline than seawater, but the uh, iron ratios are seawater ratios. Uh, so how can you get you know, seawater? Before I talked to you about meltwater, which is very fl fresh, you know, either on the surface or at the base of the ice, how can you start some kind of a groundwater system based on seawater? Well, the only scenario that we can come up with involves actually a, a ice sheet history and a climate change. Uh, so you may or may not, may not know that actually big parts of the Antarctic ice sheet sit, sit below sea level. And this is important for glaciologists because we believe that there are a few processes that make ice sheet, the parts of the ice sheets that are sitting below sea level more unstable, more prone to retreat during warm glacial periods, or interglacial periods. Uh, and one of these uh, regions is this so-called Wilkes Basin, which basically sits behind these mountains that where the McMurdo Dry Valley is. So McMurdo Dry Valleys are right there, for instance. Uh, the dry valleys themselves, although not shown here, you know, the, all the major deep valleys are basically fjords. So if the ice sheet would pull back, if the ice would retreat, what comes in its place is basically seawater and you start uh, marine sedimentation, deposition of marine sediment uh, during some warm period. And then uh, as the warm period ends and the uh, uh, ice sheet re-advances back to its, close to its modern uh, position, then it sits on these marine sediments full of seawater and squeezes that seawater towards the coastline. That's kind of my, uh, and of course that took uh, place over time scales of either hundreds of thousands of years to maybe, maybe millions of years. And that's why you have you know, some enrichment uh, from chemical weathering in, in these uh, subglacial waters. Okay, so that's my kind of a story. How do I explain these uh, hypersaline brines? I start with seawater trapped in marine sediments during periods of I should retreat, maybe Pliocene, you know, one and a half million, two million years, well, two million, three million years ago, or maybe even some of the uh, warmer than today Pleistocene to interglacial, like marine isotope stage 11 uh, is, has been speculated that you had retreat of parts of these uh, marine-based uh, uh, ice sheets in Antarctica. Uh, and then once the climate cools, uh, marine sediments here, deposited here and in, in the fjord are loaded with, with weight of the ice, and that pressure squeezes these sediments. Uh, the other thing that's required is that we remove some of the water from this seawater, old seawater, ancient seawater, uh, by freezing. And that's what hyper-concentrates the solutes. Uh, we call that cryoconcentration. Instead of evaporation, you don't evaporate the water molecules into the atmosphere. When you have an ice cover, uh, you cryoconcentrate the solutes in the remaining liquid by basically uh, excluding, uh, excluding them during the freezing process. The same thing happens, of course, during sea ice formation uh, in seawater, which may be something that's uh, more familiar to you. And okay, and, and then kind of, then 
I think our survey gave us a whiff of uh, kind of two modes uh, of groundwater systems in Antarctica. Before, we only kind of thought about this system as uh, this possibility, that basically it's, uh, it's uh, fueled or recharged by uh, fresh meltwater being generated beneath the melted parts of the ice sheet, here shown in white and, uh, and uh, yellow. And now uh, we see this you know, regional groundwater system of very hypersaline groundwater. And uh, that may be representative of all these areas where you have predominant basal freezing. And the basal freezing remove, removes the, uh, the water molecules and cryoconcentrates the solutes uh, in, uh, in the remaining liquid, in the remaining groundwater. Uh, so you may, you may have higher water fluxes here, but they will, uh, the concentrations are probably lower in that groundwater that is fed by the basal melting. Here you will have relatively small fluxes, but, but potentially much more concentrated <coughs> groundwater that uh, can actually even uh, be more efficient at bringing nutrients into the, uh, into the coastal zone. Okay. Oh. Here is my uh, you know, conceptual diagram, as required in some proposals. Uh, of this kind of brine-dominated groundwater system, which starts beneath the ice sheet, uh, the ice sheet that used to be, you know, used to pull back, maybe hundreds of thousands of years ago. Some marine deposition happens here. Then the ice sheet, ice sheet moves back over the seawater in pore spaces and transforms them, squeezes them towards the margin of the ice sheet, uh, where it mixes with the meltwater uh, in the lakes, and it travels also as uh, as groundwater towards the coast, and, and that's our you know, uh, representation of the SGD uh, happening. And because you have, you know, beneath the ice sheet, there is no easy access to a lot of oxygen, uh, especially in areas that don't experience uh, significant uh, basal melting. So you have anoxic conditions that uh, favor, basically, fluids with dissolved iron, reduced iron in it, as we observe coming out in Black Hole. So that kind of fluid leaking out can be uh, quite a efficient or uh, you know, abundant source of iron. I, of course, have no idea, you know, just because something might be reaching the coastal zone, it doesn't mean that it's not somehow, you know, scavenged or oxidized fast enough so it, but that becomes not bioavailable. It's not necessarily that it actually fuels uh, biological activity. I don't know that, and nobody has really studied that in Antarctica. Uh, so I think in, in estuaries is, uh, it's called estuarine scavenging or something like that, where you basically filter out the iron that could be bioavailable uh, or use the iron that could be bioavailable, but it oxidizes too fast and it doesn't uh, contribute necessarily to biological activity. Anyhow, lots of complexity, lots of unknowns, but at least now we gave people a picture of existing groundwater system that they can use in their proposals for actual in situ SGD studies to quantify the fluxes and quantify the water fluxes and the nutrient fluxes into this zone. Rather than before, you would be proposing, you know, something that you didn't know that might even happen. You could be, as many of you who have written enough proposals know, you could be criticized by reviewers that, well, this is never going to work. Okay. Oops. Here it is. Okay, almost there. So before I give you like a last slide with kind of summary of our, you know, pulled out of our behind best guesses for fluxes, uh, there's a picture of uh, us actually doing some geochemistry and microbiology. We are just assisting Jill McCookie here uh, doing sampling of brines in a feature called Don Juan Pond, which for uh, a few decades held the title of the most saline lake in, uh, in the world. <clears throat> but it's been uh, since overtaken by some lake in Africa. Okay, here it is. Uh, so we are using basically, this is from uh, my PhD students, so blame him, uh, uh, paper. Uh, basically, we're using some va different values measured of iron uh, concentration measured in the Blood Falls brine coming out uh, of uh, the crack in a glacier, uh, different times, different whether filtered or non unfiltered, uh, also silica values because that's another limiting, limiting nutrient in this region where diatoms are a big part of 
the uh, ocean productivity. Uh, then we get flat values in gigagrams per year that are, you know, dozens, maybe at the most 170 gigagrams per year. Uh, for comparison, a previous uh, very, very erroneous study that I was a part of, uh, you know, estimated much greater values. Uh, basically, because when we did the study, we took the highest fluxes of water and multiplied them by, by the highest known concentrations of iron uh, and silica. Uh, so we've, we've had a huge overestimate by orders of magnitude compared to what we are uh, estimating now. Uh, and also, uh, a recent paper by Hudson et al. in Nature Communications, uh, they estimated about three gigagrams per year of iron coming out of groundwater in Antarctica across the entire continent. So our values are still, you know, like an order of magnitude greater than, uh, than what Hudson estimated, but a couple orders of magnitude lower than what, what we used to estimate, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Okay, if this will ever collaborate with me. Okay, uh, so just ran you through conclusions. We found a number of uh, values with hydrogeologic connectivity to, to the coastal ocean. I should mention that not all of the places where we cross, cross the coast, we can actually detect groundwater systems. Sometimes we cross the coast with our sensor and there is no uh, connectivity, hydrologic con connectivity that we can detect. Uh, so it's not omnipresent, but it, uh, it occurs under a number of glaciers and a number of uh, valleys. Uh, which of course, you know, means that it's possible that there is SGD, but it doesn't prove that there is SGD happening. Uh, the fluids in the subsurface from our data uh, are hypersaline hyper brines, roughly, uh, you know, three times more uh, saline than seawater. Uh, and from our data, we postulate that uh, there is, we're kind of describing a new uh, briny groundwater system in Antarctica that might dominate the parts of the coastal zone where the ice sheet is uh, experiencing a lot of basal freezing and where past ice sheet retreat, you know, allowed some marine sediments to be deposited to start that groundwater from, uh, from seawater uh, chemistry. Uh, and then uh, the high fluxes of nutrients are plausible according to our calcula calculations. But the kind of the most important thing for me is that at this point, we just don't have enough data to even make an order of magnitude estimate. The estimate estimates that I just showed you, they vary by several orders of magnitude. Yeah. Like we are either, our estimates are either 10 times greater uh, than, than Hudson's estimates, or they're like 100 times smaller than the estimates we, Wadam et al. published 10, 10 years ago. Uh, so more is needed if we think that it's more important enough to know how much, say, iron is coming off the continent uh, into the coastal zone of Antarctica. Uh, one very positive thing is that if you want me to detect liquid water in the subsurface within the top kilometer of Antarctica, I have a sensor for you uh, that will do it for you, or at least my Danish colleagues have. Uh, okay, and that's my questions slide. That's, that's a great question. Yeah, that depends on you know, how fast it's flowing out and how much mixing there is close to the seafloor. It could be just diffusive transport of ions rather than you know, advective. But it could, totally it could flow along the ocean floor because it's denser. But it could be somebody already detected um, high That's, uh, yeah. Mm. It would be a popular thing, thing to measure, yeah. So maybe it, it does stay in the deep just because the brine is so, you know, three, have salinity three times greater than two. Yeah. So you show a picture just before the end hinting at the interactions with microbial biologists. Is there anything you can indicate as to any aspects of 
the microwave life in these? Yeah, so the black holes, uh, you know, has been studied, and Don Juan Pond has been studied for microbes. Uh, so blood falls is definitely, uh, uh, the water is alive. We actually had a project, a separate project where we worked with some German scientists who were, or engineers really, who built a, a melt probe that they want to send one day to Enceladus to sample water there. Uh, so to collect water, the brine, before it actually comes to the surface, uh, where it could get contaminated by microbes and, you know, the interactions of uh, the brine with the uh, oxygenated atmosphere. So we collected uh, brine before it ever saw anything on the surface, and it still has microbes. The microbes are mostly of kind of marine or marinobacters, uh, except they're pygmy microbes. They're like the, they, they have much smaller cells than the equivalent uh, species of microbes in, in the seawater, which makes sense because it's a, I'm sure it's not the, like, it's not a great party place beneath the glacier in terms of nutrients and energy sources for microbes. But it's, it's alive, uh, and I think, you know, what a glaciologist can understand about microbiology, uh, the sulfur cycling is like the basis of this uh, energy fluxes through the ecosystem. Uh, that there's sulfur reducers and sulfur oxidizers, and they play that off. Just maybe, uh, I think I, I missed this. Was the iron coming from uh, weather, pretty much like because it's scraping along the bottom, or is it from the seawater, the ancient seawater that came in? Or there's is it a mix of both? There's, there's some iron probably from the ancient source, the seawater, but there's uh, a lot of um, chemical weathering. Uh, if you, uh, there, there's actually uh, a, a lot of mafic rock, so which is very iron rich. Uh, which comes from Jurassic times when Antarctica, Australia, and Africa, and South America were together, and then there was a breakup of that continent, and that breakup was associated with a lot of uh, injection of huge sheets of, uh, of mafic uh, volcanic rocks that you can find on all these continents. And that actually, you can see that in these uh, mountains, often as that dark band right there, so there's a lot of iron-rich minerals for those uh, waters to interact with. Uh, in, in this, you know, specific region. Uh, so that's probably, most of that iron is most likely from chemical weathering of these rocks. So the ancient um, seawater was providing the other salts? Yeah, it's, it's okay. well, yeah, the iron is not, the iron concentration here, like if you would take the ra ratio of iron to chloride, it would be way higher than it is for seawater. Yeah, I want uh, some questions from people that are younger than, say, <laughs> 30 years old. How about that? <laughs> or 35?